Welcome to this lecture on the pastoral epistles. Uh, the pastoral epistles are 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Um, these are real interesting letters. Uh, what you see in front of you is an image of uh, the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, the pastoral epistles. Um, all of these letters, uh, there's no kind of textual discrepancies like what we found uh, in Ephesians and Ephesus. Um, but these are all uh, really disputed epistles. So let's turn the page on this book and look at the pastoral epistles. Uh, as we'll see, these epistles represent issues that developed in the late first century and early second century of the common era. Uh, because of the timing of these issues, uh, Paul would have been dead by the time these letters were written. Uh, Paul was, you know, uh, in church tradition, he was killed during the time uh, Nero was the emperor of the Roman Empire. And the problems that are faced in these letters and the types of structures that were kind of put in place in these lectures, uh, letters indicate that they were much later than when Paul would have uh, lived. So uh, the timing is interesting. So the vast majority of the vocabulary in these letters also show much more similarities with other early Christian writings from the early 2nd century than with Paul's undisputed letters. In other words, his letters to Rome, his letters to Corinth, his letters to the churches in Galatia, his letter to Philippians, his letter to Philemon, uh, the, the vocabulary that he uses in those uh, letters are hardly mentioned in uh, the pastoral epistles. And in fact, the vocabulary that's used in the pastoral epistles uh, only uses about a third of the vocabulary in Paul's undisputed epistles. So the vocabulary is fundamentally different. And I really like the way Airman uh, talks about how you can tell the differences um, in, in his work. So, so pay real close attention to the reading this week from Airman. Uh, there's not a lot compared to what we've been doing, I, I don't think. So um, take your time and, and read through Airman's work um, because I think he, may, he has some illustrations that make some sense. Uh, and what's also really different that we don't get in Paul's undisputed letters at all is this hierarchical church structure in the letters. Uh, Airman calls it the clergy, uh, the creed, and the canon. Uh, but nowhere does uh, Paul ta uses one term, uh, elder or uh, presbyter in Philippians. Uh, but the way that he talks about structure, or the way structure is talked about in the pastoral epistles, is fundamentally different than the what Paul envisions in his undisputed letters. And this shift uh, towards understanding the faith as teachings that was passed down from one generation to the next is fundamentally different than the way Paul talks about faith uh, in his undisputed uh, epistles. Up until this point, faith uh, really meant faith in Jesus, uh, faith uh, in or the faith of Jesus. And it all wrapped around Jesus' death and resurrection. Here, the faith looks like uh, a, a body of teachings that were passed down from one generation to the next. Uh, Airman calls these the, the creed. And specifically look at 1 Timothy 1.10 and Titus 1.9 and 13. So even the way, even when the similar vocabulary is used in the pastorals, like the faith or to pistos, uh, ta, uh, ta pistos uh, in the Greek, the way it's used in, in, in pastoral epistles refers to something fundamentally different than what uh, the referent of that is in Paul's undisputed letters. And then finally, and this is to a lesser degree, we find the seeds of the beginning of Scripture, uh, and not just Scripture in the sense of the Old Testament or the Torah, but scripture in addition to that. 
and it all suggests uh, a later period than Paul's lifetime. In other words, there are some things that looks like Jesus' uh, teachings that, that's referred to in, in the pastoral epistles, and it's elevated to the status of Scripture. That's the first time we see this uh, in any of, uh, any of Paul's letters um, that are attributed to him. So the similarity in vocabulary, similarity in style, and the similarity, similarity in content with um, authors and other Christian writings in the early 2nd century suggests that the same author wrote all of these epistles. In other words, uh, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus are really similar in vocabulary, style, and content. So we think that um, a single author penned all of these letters. So now let's look at um, 1 Timothy in, in particular and look at how Timothy, uh, in this letter, there's this whole focus on control and order. Uh, Timothy, this is I, I put this picture of that library in Ephesus up again because the theme of Timothy, or, or Timothy seems to be a pastor in Ephesus, according to uh, this letter. So, opening up 1 Timothy, uh, right there in 1-3, uh, it has Timothy as the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And Timothy is appointed to do at least three things. Uh, in chapter 1, 3-11, through 11, Timothy is appointed to control false teachers. Chapter 2, 1-15, through 15, Timothy is to create order in the church. And then chapter 3, 1 through 13, he's to hand choose moral leaders for the church. Now that is some heavy pastoral um, authority given from uh, supposedly Paul to Timothy. Now what's interesting to point out in this is uh, with all the writings that Paul has that are undisputed to the church in Corinth, uh, I mean, we have 16 chapters, I mean, uh, uh, 15 chapters in one letter and 12 or 13 in another that we have. And we think between those two letters, we may have three or four. So that's a lot of writing. And nowhere, nowhere in First and Second Corinthians does Paul address any leaders. Uh, in other words, the, the church in Corinth doesn't look like they had any kind of pastor or bishop or elder or deacon. And so Paul never appeals to anybody in charge because it's a very egalitarian church. Now there are problems between rich and poor in Corinth and there's problems with uh, kind of chaotic worship services, uh, but nowhere does Paul appeal to the leader of the church and tell the leader of the church to get control of things. And that's mainly because there wasn't anybody in that position. There wasn't a position like that to be had. So uh, when in this epistle where this supposed Paul is writing to Timothy, he tells Timothy to control false teachers because Timothy has apparently uh, the authority to do so. He also has the authority to create order in the church. Uh, and he also has the authority to appoint moral leaders for the church. Um, now, that structure just simply didn't exist uh, in Corinth or in Rome or in any of the churches that Paul wrote in his undisputed epistles. So those are the reasons why we think that uh, these pastoral epistles were much later and seem to address different, kind, different uh, issues during, the time, uh, during that time period. Uh, and so it shows also a strong orientation for acceptable acceptable Greco-Roman social hierarchies, specifically related to women. So what we had in Colossians and Ephesians was this house to film, this uh, household codes. Well, in First and Second Timothy and Titus, these things are the way the church is supposed to be structured. So Colossians and Ephesians, it's basically talking about a household, and how households are supposed to be run. Here, he brings that into the church, and, uh, and what was kind of reserved for family is now 
structured within the hierarchy of the church itself. So you got this kind of uh, another level uh, of structure and hierarchy beyond even the deuterocanonical, uh, deuteropauline letters. So let's look at uh, Timothy and turn to another page. The, the reason kind of First Timothy was written and the pastorals were all written for two reasons. Control, and this is controlling the false teachings. Uh, here we hear in, in one through four, uh, chapter one, four, myths and in, endless genealogies. Um, this idea that false teachers are forbidding marriage and demand abstinence from food looks kind of like those food laws. And then in 620, avoid profane chatter and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So you have these false teachers who seem to be Jewish mystics of some sort. Uh, Airman calls them Gnostics. I'm uncomfortable with using that term. I think that term um, kind of is really a term that was used um, for bad guys, really. I mean, uh, and so there wasn't anything called Gnosticism. It just becomes a name later on in early Christianity. Um, but these false teachings, this is kind of what the false teachings looks like. And Timothy is supposed to control that. And, and the way he controls it is through structure. So he, he speaks out against these false teachers, but he also creates a structure that's able to endure and uh, kind of suppress this uh, other teaching. So he's a, there to appoint morally upright men in particular uh, in positions of bishop slash overseer, presbyter slash elders, and deacon slash ministers. It looks like the presbyters are there to take care of spiritual needs of the congregation, and deacons are there to take care of the physical needs, like food ministries and things like that. Uh, but that structure just does not exist in the first century for the most part. I mean, this is a structure that is clearly... Uh, early second century, and which is problematic uh, for thinking this is authentic to Paul. And this church structure then will help create a system that will keep the false teachings at bay and keep the faith, which is kind of the creed or the traditions that have been passed down, in the center of the community. So uh, structure and control. Here's just a mosaic of uh, there's actually a, this is a much wider mosaic, but this is all I could get on uh, in, in this frame um, of kind of the structural hierarchy. Uh, this form of church structure is completely absent in any of Paul's undisputed letters. It's much more similar to the emerging church structures of the second, early 2nd second century when false teachings uh, were a major problem. And I just want you to understand that there's a distinctive difference between Paul's opponents in his undisputed letters and false teachings in these later letters. In other words, his opponents that he faces, even in Galatia, these, these kind of more Jewish law-oriented people, they, he, they were in fights with each other, but he never called them false teachers. Um, and, and this kind of, he had the same kind, he had opponents in all of his undisputed letters. So he was always kind of in conflict. But that's fundamentally different than uh, what he what's used, the terminology that's used in these letters related to false teachings. So let's turn the page to 2 Timothy uh, and kind of go through this. This is just an old icon of, uh, of Timothy. You can see in the icon he's much younger looking than a lot of the other apostles that we get. So 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy is less like 1 Timothy and Titus from a content standpoint. So 1 Timothy and Titus get pretty specific uh, about false teachers. 2 Timothy is much more fuzzy and uh, kind of general. Uh, however, the opening greeting for 2 Timothy is nearly verbatim with 1 Timothy. That's worth uh, paying attention to. So uh, take time and, and read through that. Uh, and then the warning, like I said, the warning against false teachers and false teachings is not as specific in first uh, as in First Timothy, and simply turns into name calling actually in chapter three, two through five. And there's what's interesting about Second Timothy. There's this 
considerable time spent telling Timothy's story. Uh, Timothy, both his mother and grandfather, grandmother were believers, Eunice and Lois. So Timothy is a third generation believer. Uh, he was acquainted with the sacred writings from childhood. He was ordained into the ministry. Paul says that uh, people laid his hands on him, which indicates ordination. Uh, it, he worked with Paul in other cities in Asia Minor, according to chapter 3, 10 through 11. And he's charged to overcome false teachings kind of throughout the letter. Uh, so 2 Timothy, if it gives us anything, it gives us a, a small window into, into Timothy if it, it can be assumed that this is... Uh, this information is true. I mean, we know that Paul didn't write this. Most all scholars believe that Paul didn't write it. Uh, but it is interesting to get this autobiographical or biographical information about Timothy. Moving on to Titus. Titus and 1 Timothy are very similar in content. Um, and again, Titus, it's like, uh, Titus is like 1 Timothy, second chapter, if you will because it's all about control and order. Um, according to Titus, Titus is Paul's chosen representative on the island of Crete, and I'll just back up here for a second. Uh, this map here is a map of um, ancient uh, Greece and Crete. Uh, the island, the long east-west island is in red. That's where Crete is. So it looks like, uh, according to Titus, uh, that Paul has chosen Titus as a representative to the island of Crete. And when I say this, please hear me. I say Paul sent him, but that's how the letter is narrated, okay? That's how it's written. Nobody believes that Paul wrote this letter to Titus. Uh, but in the narrative of the letter, uh, Titus is appointed by Paul to Crete, uh, and he's appointed to handpick church leaders in every town, again, a typo, I'm bad about that, but in every town throughout the whole island. Uh, he gives extended qualifications for elders slash presbyters in 1, 5 through 9. Uh, he talks about false teaching as the circumcision party. Uh, the, the, these, are the, these are the folks uh, that's causing this, the source of all the false teaching. And Titus is to combat this with sound doctrine. This is, again, like the teachings that have been passed down. Airman calls it the creed. And the sound doctrine includes social order that's typical of Greco-Roman norms, uh, specifically the kind of the hierarchical work. So let me go back here. Um, this is kind of the nature of the letter of Titus. It's very similar to... Uh, 1 Timothy in the circumcision party looks like, again, a Jewish type uh, faction, that a Jewish Christian uh, faction or Jews who believe in Jesus uh, kind of thing. But they're also pretty ecstatic so, uh, and, and, and believe in kind of charismatic space. So this tends to be common in all these. So let's talk now about this whole group of pastoral epistles. 1st, 2nd Timothy uh, and Titus predominantly are concerned with control. And that control is specifically related to correcting and combating false teaching. Uh, and it's, these letters are primarily concerned with structure. And that structure has to do with the hierarchical structure within churches and the social order within the church, which should mirror the Greco-Roman world. Uh, these reflect both the vocabulary of early Christian writings from the early 2nd century and the issues that these writers uh, during that period faced. And so none of the material within these letters reflect any situation from Paul's lifetime. So someone who understood Paul as an authority figure and understood themselves as writing to combat problems within the churches in Western Asia Minor most likely penned all of these letters. Uh, so that's kind of what the pastoral epistles look like. 
And as we close uh, this book and finish this book uh, about the pastoral epistles, I'll leave you with the last words in Titus. Grace be with you all. Written by Paul. Or is it?